Hello everyone out there, this is Peter Harris from Commercial Property Advisors and author of this book, Commercial Real Estate Investing for Dummies, as well as coach and mentor to many commercial real estate investors all across America. The subject and title of today's video is called Sell Stores Investing for Beginners. So let's get started. I'm going to go over with you eight different topics. Number one, why invest in sell stores facilities? Number two, how to find self-storage facilities to invest in. Number three, the three main types of self-storage facilities that exist today. And number four, the two main types of deal scenarios that you're going to find out there. Number five, I'm going to give you things to watch out for. These are seven specific things that as a self-storage investor, beginner, you need to watch out for. Okay? Number six, Funding your deal. Who are the sources of the funding to purchase your very first self storage facility? All right. Uh, number seven, the two most common myths, myths I have seen as a coach and mentor and advisor out there and people investing in self storage facilities. And lastly, we're going to analyze and break down a real live deal. Okay. All right. So let's get started. Okay, number one, why invest in self-storage facilities? Well, let me share some things with you. Um, if you were to get married, would you necessarily throw yourself out? No, you wouldn't. You would put it in storage. Now, when one of our brave young men in the military go off on a tour of duty and they go away for a year or two or three, do they throw their things away? No, they put it in storage. When our economy tanked a few years ago, uh, people were forced to downsize, unfortunately, and what did they do with their stuff? They put it into storage. Now, as the economy comes back up and people buy extra things, where do they put their extra things or their old things? Into storage. All right, so there's a huge demand for storage and it's growing. Let me share some facts with you. All right, number one, one out of every... 10 people in the U.S. actually use self-storage. That's incredible. And there are roughly 314 million people in this country of ours. All right, number two, the self-storage business, there are 50,000 self-storage facilities in the U.S. Can you believe that? 50,000 and growing. Um, back in the year 2000, there were only there were roughly 30,000. Fast forward to today, there are 50,000 self storage facilities in the U.S. currently. Fact number three: the self storage business is a 220 billion dollar industry. That's billion with a B. All right, so it's a huge industry, and Wall Street has even taken notice. All right, fact number four. Did you know that 80% of all self-storage facilities are owned by mom-and-pop operations, by small and medium-sized um, medium companies, or, or just singular investors? 80% of, of these 50,000 are owned by mom-and-pop operators. The 20% are owned by the big firms, by the big companies, by the institutions. That 80% is where you and I play in. That's huge. All right, next is, what is the greatest attribute of self-storage facilities? Uh, for me, it's simple. It is cash flow. Let me explain. If you were to get your own very, your, your own, um, your very own self-storage unit space to store your extra things, some of us are thinking, oh, I'll just keep it in there just for a few months and then I'll clean it out later. But that's not the case. The last thing you want to do on a Saturday is go down and clean out and cancel your self storage unit and put it someplace else. It's the last thing you want to do. So what happens, what normally happens in self storage, this is very typical, is the the average stay in a self storage facility is actually one year to three years. That's the average. Some companies the average stay is three years. In the apartment business, the average stay is six to seven months. So in the self storage business, the average stay is one to three years. Huge difference. And why is that a huge difference? It's because the turnover costs, all right, 
in, in all commercial real estate, one of the biggest costs we have besides real estate taxes are the turnover costs. Turnover costs are the costs you incur when you get the unit or the apartment or the self-storage unit or the commercial space ready for the new tenant. That can cost in the thousands of dollars. In the self-storage business, all it takes is a broom and a dustpan to get your unit ready. All right, so there's a saying in the self-storage business, uh, no toilets, no trash, and no tenants. And that is so true in this business here. All right, the last thing I want to share with you is you may be wondering, as an investor, what is the difference between a single family home investment versus a self-storage facility investment? The answer is very simple, all right? If you were to have a single family home and that tenant moved out, what would be your income for the next month? It would be zero, all right? For a self-storage facility, let's say you have uh, 200 units and even 10 people move out or 5% of, of all your tenants move out, you still have uh, you know, tons and tons of uh, income coming in to still pay all the bills, all right? So you get a, an efficiency with, with uh, self-storage facilities by the sheer number of people paying uh, you income. All right, so that is the biggest difference. All right, okay, so next what we're gonna do is part two, we're gonna go into how to find self-storage facilities. Okay, number two, finding self-storage deals. All right, I'm gonna share with you three different ways in which to do this. Number one is to go online, go on to the internet. There's plenty of deals there to begin looking, all right? Um, I, I listed out here a, a few websites for you to just begin your search. And um, probably the most, two most popular websites out there, and they are uh, uh, subscription-based, but they're very popular and have majority of the listings online. They are loopnet.com and colstar.com, and obviously, again, the two biggest ones out there. Other ones that are free and you can just uh, peruse and browse on is uh, selfstorages.com. Okay, that's an S, selfstorages.com. <clears throat> Another website I like, I'm frequently on, is called bizbysell.com, bizbysell.com. Um, a couple more useful ones are argus-selfstorage.com. It's a pretty popular one too. And lastly, um, selfstoragebrokersofamerica.com. So what a long website, but yeah, selfstoragebrokersofamerica.com. So these are just uh, a few of the websites you can begin uh, to look for uh, deals um, on self-storage facilities. Uh, number two, the broker community. All right, number two is about relationships. Real estate, particularly commercial real estate, is about building and nurturing relationships. Here's the goal. You want the goal to be when your, when your favorite commercial real estate agent gets a new listing or gets a new pocket listing or hears of a seller who wants to sell, right? You want him to think of you. So you want to be on his A-list. The only way to get on his A-list is to pick up the phone and begin nurturing a relationship with him, all right? Do not be intimidated. They are just like you and I. They put their pants on uh, one leg at a time. They get dressed just like we do. They're just like us. And uh, basically, people want to work with people they like. All right? So be genuine when you talk with them, but build up their relationship. What I want you to do with this broker community is I want you to focus on uh, commercial estate brokers that have a focus on this niche market of self-storage facilities. You need that expertise. Um, do not use a, a residential agent to purchase a self-source facility. You need expertise, all right? Okay, number three is, which is my favorite, is to do a direct mail um, a marketing campaign. Basically, we're gonna mail um, letters directly to the owners, to the sellers of property, all right? And these are not gonna be major corporations or firms. We're going to mail very specifically to the mom and pop owners, all right, the medium-sized um, uh, owners of self-source facilities, all right, people we can actually speak to that have authority to, to sell. You can expect probably a 2 to 4% uh, 
uh, response rate on those letters. All right, so that's how I want you to do that. So these top three, internet, begin with the internet. This is the easiest way to go. Number two, start building up and nurturing your relationships with the brokers. And three, start the process of getting your direct mail campaign uh, in, in, in process. Okay, number three and four, three main types of substores facilities you're going to find out there once you begin your search. And secondly, the two main types of deal uh, scenarios you're going you're to run into as you begin your search as well. Okay, number one, um, you're going to find uh, three different types of properties in terms of classes, all right? Class A, Class B, and Class C. Let me explain. Class A, and you guys know this, Class A are the beautiful properties, the brand new properties, and the best locations. They're, they're, uh, the year built is from the year 2000 to present. They're in prime retail locations. They're, they're made of uh, brick and glass. They're multi-level. They're beautiful. They have great signage there. And they're mainly owned by the big institutions, all right, by the big companies. Somewhere we don't, we don't want to play. Uh, very high price um, facilities, uh, priced out of our price range uh, for the typical investor. Cap rates very, very low and your competition would be institutional uh, type of buyers and players there. Again, someplace where we, where we don't want to be. All right, that's Class A. Class B is where you want to be. Class B is right below Class A. This is, um, these facilities are built in the 80s and 90s, and they're primarily owned by the mom and pop uh, operators. All right, these are operators that we can speak to. We can't speak to these guys. These are the institutions. But we can call up and speak to the mom and pop uh, operators and get them to uh, sell us their facilities. All right. So again, this this uh, class B is where you want to be. Uh, they 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 look maybe similar to class A, but they're not as beautiful. They're probably not in the best location, but they're stable. They have stable number numbers. They haven't operated well for years. So great opportunity for cash flow. Uh, great opportunity for uh, just to own something very stable and rock, walk right into it. Hardly any deferred maintenance, just very stable, okay? So I would say Class B is a working class type of self storage facilities, where you want to be, again. All right, the third class is Class C. These facilities are older, much older. They're built in the 60s and the 80s. Word of caution here, okay? Word of caution here is do not play in the Class C arena until you have experience or unless you bring an experienced partner into your business, all right? Class C will be maybe the uh, gravel driveways, all right? Maybe no gates, maybe no security, all right? Uh, it may have some deferred maintenance. It may need a paint job, may, new, new, may need a new driveway, it may need updating. Uh, and, uh, for example, Class C, maybe a few years should be completely obsolete and if not remodeled will become com completely obsolete and shut down that's class c that's why there's a word of caution here all right this class c probably has the most upside but the upside is realized if you have the expertise to do so all right okay uh, next is the two main types of deal scenarios the first deal scenario you're going to run into is the turnkey or the stabilized deal. That will be primarily your class A and your class B. All right, these are ready to go, uh, turnkey deals. Uh, you buy your own and you cash flow. There's really nothing else to do there. All right, so, um, but they're stable. All right, easy to get financing, um, good areas, just very stable. The outlook is great. On the other hand, um, another side of the turnkey deal is the turnaround deal. This is where the property is going to be distressed, all right? You're going to have to turn around into a stabilized or turnkey deal, all right? And the reason why it's distressed or a turnaround deal is because it has poor management uh, or no management. It could be in a very bad area. It could be in a location where the demographics are not good, meaning not enough customers. Uh, it could have a lot of deferred maintenance. Uh, it could just be not a, it just could be completely obsolete and needs to be turned around. All right. So 
turnaround, I mean the turnkey deal is stabilized, the turnaround deal you're going to run into is distress. One of the two you're going to run into. Okay, number five. Number five is seven things to look for as a beginning investor uh, for self storage units. Now these seven things are absolute must. These are things that you must know before you can get, uh, before you can move forward. Okay, they are, number one is size. You have to know the size of the, of the self storage facility. In fact, you should uh, have a goal for about 30 to 40,000 square feet uh, of self-storage units, of uh, self-storage space, in order to make it worth your while. In fact, you need about 30,000 square feet in itself just to afford a full-time manager. And by the way, uh, that's about uh, about two about 200 self-storage units. All right. So number one is size. You need a, a minimum size. <clears throat> However, if you are going to self-manage and you want to start really really small, you're doing all the management yourself. You can buy a small, a smaller self storage facility. Um, just make sure the numbers work out for you. Okay. All right. Secondly, unit mix. What I mean by unit mix is you need to have a mixture of the size of self storage units. If you have uh, a self storage facility where they're all the same size, what's going to suffer is you're not, you're not going to have enough variation to offer your client base, your customer base. So your occupancy is going to be very, very low. Incomes going to be very, very low, and you will suffer. All right, so what I want you to have here is a, a mixture of unit size, some 5x5, five five, some 5x10, five some 10x30s, some 10x20s. Uh, so have a mixture of sizes of your self-storage units. All right, number three, very important, is location. All right, in the self-storage business, we focus on a one three and five mile radius of demographics. You are going to pull up about 90% of your customer base is going to be within this one and three and five mile radius. So radius. So wherever your, if your self storage facility is here, if it's right here, you're going to draw a one mile radius, two mile, three mile radius, and a five mile radius. All right. So in, this air, in these areas here, this is where you're going to pull most of or nearly all of your, your customer base. So you need to do research on this um, radius here to make sure you have uh, enough potential customers. All right. Uh, next is on location. Is, is the area growing or is it shrinking? All right. Is it growing or shrinking? You can find that out quickly by driving over there and asking some of the local uh, merchants and, um, uh, and ask them the, the question, is this area growing or shrinking? Is that simple? Okay, nothing complicated there. Next is, are you in the path of progress? All right, wherever you're looking to buy your self source facility, are, uh, is the city uh, expanding in your area or away from your area? All right. If it's going away from your area, I want you to think second about buying that self-source facility. If it's coming near you or towards you, that's a good sign. All right. Next is competition. You have to know your competition, right? If you have um, someone who's right near you with the same prices, all right, but his uh, facility is much newer, he's going to get uh, customers before you. So understand who your competition is within this one and three five mile radius. All right. Next is traffic count. All right. What I mean by traffic count is how many cars, how many trucks, how many motorcycles, how many people are, are uh, driving by or, or walking by your facility every single day. All right. It's a very important number in commercial real estate. In fact, these days to get started, you can even Google a traffic count with an address and Google will begin to tell you what the traffic count is. All right. All right. So next. So number four traffic count. Number five is signage and visibility. All right. People must uh, know where you are in order to uh, frequent your self storage facility. All right. So signage a lot of times is dictated by the uh, local laws in the city. So make sure that you really understand uh, if you can or or cannot put up a larger sign. All right. Visibility. You got to make sure you don't that you're not located in an area where we have to make four right hand turns 
to find your facility. You know what I mean by that. All right. Next is um, management. All right. You really should understand how this place is being run. Is it managed by the owner? Did they hire a property management company? You know, do you, how do you uh, plan on managing it? Are you planning on managing it yourself or having a live-in person? Are you going to, what are you going to do there? So uh, understand what the current management situation is. All right. Lastly, drainage. I put this here because of personal experience. All right. Uh, not uh, having poor drainage in any area in a self-source facility will cause you to not uh, be able to rent out those spaces, all right? And if you do, uh, if there's a flood, it could go in and flood the contents of that self-storage. Not good, not good, all right? So uh, drainage, you can walk around and get an initial look at the drainage um, uh, issues if there are, and, but when you do your due diligence, all right, when you do, when you do due diligence, your, your prop inspector will probably give you more details on any potential drainage issues there. All right, okay, so again, these are seven things to look for when you are beginning to look at self-sourced facilities as an investment. Okay, number six is uh, how to fund your self-sourced facility investment. Okay, all right, let's talk about the basics. All right, now in any income producing, let me repeat, any commercial real estate that's income producing, in order for a bank uh, to lend you money, they're going to require three things. And these three things, these three things are in cement because gone are the days where you could, uh, back in the day, you could uh, get any loan for any commercial real estate so long as it cash flowed. So those days are gone. Now it's back to normal. Here it is. All right. So the banks are going to have three qualifications for you. Their first qualification is they're going to look at their property's income and expense, all right? Property's income and expense. How much is the property making? How much are its expenses? And what is left over, all right? So they're going to base the loan on what's left over because what's left over pays for the mortgage, okay? All right, got it? So they're going to look at that, number one. Number two, the, any bank's going to look at the property's condition and its location, all right? And the property's location and uh, condition what you're looking for doesn't need a roof, doesn't need a parking lot, doesn't need a, uh, a, a paint job. You know, what does the property uh, need at this point to make it look nice and make the bank feel safe and happy that they want to make a loan on it, all right? Next is the property location. Again, location is very important in commercial real estate, right? You can fix a property, but you can't fix a location. So to a bank, location is very important, okay? Next is the, the third thing the bank will look at you. The third qualification is they're, they're going to look at the borrowers. They're going to look at you and if you have partners. They're going to look at your financial strength to see if you have good credit, to see if you have any, uh, any savings, to see if, it, if you have any other real estate investing experience. All right? So the bank's going to look at those three things, and once they feel comfortable with those three things, they will uh, most likely make you a loan okay? of some sort. All right. So next is uh, sources of money for um, your, to finance your self serve facility. Uh, here are several. You can have uh, you can go to local and regional banks. Okay, savings and loans. All right. You can go to credit unions. Credit unions love uh, self storage. All right. You can go to the SBA, the Small Business Administration. All right. They have a couple of uh, lending programs specifically tailored for self storage. All right. And in fact, um, the loan programs are called, I hope you can read the fine print here, the, there's, a, there's a loan program called the 7A uh, loan program and the 504 program. 7A and 504 uh, lending programs specifically tailored for self-source facilities. And in these type of loans, uh, you can come down with, with as little as 10% down. So 10% or less down, okay? And the local banks and credit unions, they're asking for about 25% down. Uh, so far, interest rates, interest rates today are excellent. Um, uh, apartment, uh, lenders love apartments and self-storage the same. We can get apartment loans very cheaply. Same with self-storage because it's a cash flowing instrument. Banks love uh, stabilized properties that produce cash flow, self-storage included. All right. 
The uh, last part, you can go to private investors or you can do uh, seller financing where the seller becomes the bank for you. And basically how that would work, I'll explain to you in this common scenario here. All right. So in all my uh, years of coaching and closing on the sub storage deals, uh, here is a very common scenario. I'll just use the name Investor Joe. Okay. Investor Joe is a, um, uh, a student or a client and, or he's just an investor who wants to buy um, self storage uh, facilities. He doesn't have uh, the down payment and he doesn't have the net worth, the financial strength the bank is looking for. All right. He just has the time and the desire, which, which goes a long way. So what he does is he goes out and he gets a credit partner all right, who has strong credit and he has great net worth. Then he goes out and he goes to private investors and raises private money for the down payment. He combines the two. All right, he goes to the bank with himself, with his debt partner, with his credit partner. They get the loan and they close on a deal. All right. In exchange, uh, um, Joe pays his, um, his investor and his credit partner in exchange for you know, their money and their, their credit. He gives them a fixed rate of return and a part of the deal and Joe keeps a portion for himself. All right. So we do a lot of that um, uh, in our company here. And we teach that in fact. But uh, that's a pretty common uh, scenario. All right. Okay. So now you understand uh, funding and how it works for self storage facilities. Okay, number seven, I'm going to share with you the two biggest myths, the two biggest myths of self-storage investing, okay? They are, number one, the biggest, the, number one is that it's a hands-off, passive income business. It is not. It is not. Some people teach you, some people teach out there that you can automate everything in self-storage facilities, and you cannot. It's, it's impossible. You can automate some of them but you can't automate uh, everything in a self storage facility. If you do, you're going to run into big trouble. Let me tell you the truth here. So in any uh, commercial real estate business that's income producing, you need what I call the four M's to be successful. Let me show what the four M's are. The four M's, you need the four M's to run any commercial real estate business profitably and successfully for a long time. You need systems of handling the money. You need systems of handling the marketing. You need a system to handle the management. You need a system to handle the maintenance. All right? Look what happens if one falls down. Let's say the, the, the system for the money isn't all that great. What happens is a lack of money will make you do a lack of marketing. Lack of marketing will bring in, uh, will cause a lack of money. A lack of money means a lack of maintenance and the spiral begins. All right? I can pick another one. Let's say you have a, a, a lack of management, all right? Lack of management means that uh, you're not doing any marketing. Um, you're not handling money well. You're not handling maintenance well. Downward spiral, okay? So I can pick any of these four M's, any one of these, right? And if one spirals, the other three begin to spiral as well, okay? So the myth number one is busted. So uh, it is not a hands-off passive income business. The better you are at managing your business, the more money you're going to make, the better sleep you're going to get, and the, the longer that you will last in this business. All right? Okay. Myth number two is that self-storage is a quick turnaround business. Okay? That is a myth. All right? And let me give you a, a comparison. In the apartment business, all right, if we were to purchase a 40-unit apartment complex and we had to rehab the entire complex, that may take us up to a year, depending on the rehab. And I'm, and I'm talking getting everything in, getting it fixed up, and getting the new tenants back in. We can, we can do that all within a year. All right? Now, in the self-storage business, because it is slower moving, all right, let's say you have, you're, re, you're rehabbing a, uh, uh, even a 40-unit facility, self-storage facility, rather small, but let's keep it in equal terms, 40-unit self-storage facility, it can take three years to get that facility stabilized. Three years. So it is not a quick turnaround business, all right? It's going to take four M's and uh, constant uh, uh, money, managing of the money, constant uh, marketing, constant oversight and management, and constant uh, uh, making sure maintenance is, uh, is upkept. 
All right, okay, all right. So uh, those are the two uh, biggest myths of the self-storage business. Okay, so the last part of this training is uh, we're going to analyze a real deal. I found this deal on LoopNet and um, I removed the name of the deal just so we can keep the privacy intact, okay? All right, so the location of the deal is it's in a small town in Georgia. It's uh, 270 self storage units spread over 32,000 square feet and it's over three and a half acres. So sizable property. It's currently 80% occupied. It's 20 years old. It's gated. And last year, the property brought in $79,000. So the question is, uh, well, first of all, that's all we know. That's all that's given on, online as, as information. And the second question is, is, is this a good deal? All right. So how we determine if it's a good deal or not is we're going to look at the property's annual cash flow and what the cash on cash return is. Okay. That's going to be our standard. All right, so let's get started here. All right, uh, for the sake of time, I did some pre-calculations on my notes here, okay? So I can save some time here. All right, now, when you analyze any commercial real estate property, you need three things. Number one is you need the annual income. Number two, you need the annual expenses, the operating expenses. Remember, it does not include the mortgage, okay? Number one, the income. Number two, the expenses. Number three, you need to know what the debt service is. What the debt service is, is the mortgage uh, payments times 12, so the annual mortgage payments. So again, income, expense, and debt service. So let's start off with those three things, all right? Number one is the income, and it's get actually given to us as $79,000 per year, okay, given to us. Now, we need to find out what the expenses are to operate this property, all right? Now, um, on the online uh, information, the expenses are not given. However, in the self-storage industry, we do have a rule of thumb that we use to calculate expenses on a facility of this size. What we do is we take 40% of the income as the expenses, okay? So we take 40% of 79,000 and we take that as the expenses. I have that calculated out up here. That comes out to be, I rounded up the number, comes out to be $32,000 per year, all right? So we have an annual, annual expense of $32,000 per year, all right? So next is income minus expense equals your net operating income, your NOI, Okay, so that gives us $47,000. Okay, so what that means, what this NOI number means is after we collect all the income, we've had all the expenses, what's left over to pay the mortgage is $47,000. Now, after we pay the mortgage, uh, what's remaining is cash flow. You got it? Okay, so income minus expenses, all right, equals your NOI. Then we pay the mortgage and what's left over goes in your pocket. That's what we're going to figure out. All right. So next, um, uh, we got to figure out the, in we have the income, we have expenses. Next is debt service. All right. So, you know, I forgot one thing over here. I'm sorry. The for the asking price, they were asking $485,000. Okay. And for the sake of simplicity, we're going to take that as our offer price as well. All right. So now, to figure out what your debt service is going to be, your monthly mortgage payments times 12, is to find out what your mortgage balance is going to be, right? So in commercial, we usually pay, have a down payment of 25% of the purchase price. 25% of $485,000, all right? So we have a down payment, 25% of $485,000 is... 121,250. Okay, that's 25% down. Okay? After you make the down payment of here, we're going to subtract the down payment from here to figure out our mortgage balance. So we're going to have a mortgage balance, again, I already have it all figured out on my sheet here, of 363,000. 
750. Okay, so after we make our, our down payment, what's left to make payments on is going to be 363,750. I'm going to use a typical uh, prevailing mortgage rate of 5% amortized over 30 years to figure out what my payments would be. All right, so my mortgage payments will be is going to be nineteen hundred and fifty two dollars and sixty nine cents that's based upon an interest rate of five percent okay and a thirty year amortization all right okay those two things that's my payment that's the that's the uh, monthly payment now we since we have an annual income and annual expenses annual NOI we need an annual payment so we multiply this number by 12, okay? So this times 12 equals 23,432, okay? So if you were to make these monthly payments over 12 months, you may have spent your debt service of being 23,432. Okay, so now if you recall at the beginning, I said you need three things, you need the income, you need the expenses and you need the debt service. So we have the income, we have the expenses, all right, and we have the debt service. So basically the cash flow, if you recall, is your NOI minus your debt service. All right. So forty-seven thousand minus twenty-three thousand four thirty-two is going to equal your cash flow. So I have a cash flow of Twenty-three thousand five sixty-eight. All right. So this this self-storage facility, uh, two hundred seventy units, thirty-two thousand square feet, with three and a half acres, produces twenty-three thousand five hundred sixty-eight dollars per year, cash flow in your pocket. All right. So uh, from a cash flow standpoint, uh, this deal passes. But how about from a cash and cash or a return on investment standpoint? All right. So an equation I want to introduce to you, but if you've been watching my previous videos, you know I really focus on cash and cash return. Basically, your, your cash and cash return, I'm going to shorten it for cash and cash, okay, cash and cash, is equal to your, your cash flow annually divided by your down payment, okay? So if my cash flow here is 23000 568 divided by my down payment of 121,250. All right, if you do the math there, that will give you your cash and cash return or your return on investment. Again, I have it calculated out here and it comes out to be 19%. Okay, so um, this deal uh, passes, it, it answers the question. Is this a good deal or not? So from, from the information we have now, it's a go until we jump into due diligence and uh, take a closer look at the property. So this property produces cash flow of $23,000, uh, 23568 per year, and it produces an average, uh, an annual uh, return on investment of over 19%. That's pretty good. Imagine going to Bank of America or any other large bank and putting your $121,000 in the bank, what would you earn over the year? Probably uh, 1%, not, maybe not even 1%, probably 0.5 or 0.2 or even 0.1%. And commercial estate in this, in this self-source facility, which is real, remember I got this one off of LoopNet, it produces a return of 19%. Not too shabby. Okay, all right, so that ends this video here. So if you want more resources like this, please go on to our website, commercialpropertyadvisors.com, or you can simply subscribe to this um, YouTube video. Okay, this is, uh, I'm Peter Harris, and I'm your coach and mentor. Uh, this concludes self-storage investing for beginners. I'll see you later.